So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the determinants of interest rates, i.e. what drives interest rates or what interest rates are actually composed of. And before we get started on those elements of interest rates, which the curriculum really explores, I want to just devote a tiny bit of time to the concept of what an interest rate actually is. And the way your curriculum defines it is um, it, that interest rates establish the relationship between cash flows that occur at different dates. Or, um, as your curriculum puts it, it's the relationship between differently dated cash flows. So um, if you imagine a timeline, let's draw one. Now let's say this is today and this is uh, a moment in time which is one year um, away. What the interest rate is going to do is allow us to establish, as we wrote here, relationships between cash flows occurring on the one hand towards the short end of the spectrum, so today, and towards the latter end of the spectrum that's in one year's time. Now, three interpretations are given in your curriculum, so let's write them down. Interpretations. And the third one, first one, sorry, is the required rate of return. The interest rate or interest rates may be viewed as required rates of return. For example, if I'm being asked to give somebody a loan today, let's say that loan is for $100, 100 euros, or any other unit of currency, how much do I require the borrower to pay me back? Um, is it going to be 110? In which case, um, that would point to me requiring a rate of return of 10% per year, per annum. Or is it 105, in which case the required rate of return on this kind of investment would be 5%, right? So that obviously depends on the risk of the investment, something we'll talk about later on as, as a component of, um, of the uh, interest rate buildup. But as such, the relationship between an amount invested today and what I think I should be getting out of it later on. Now, a second possible interpretation, very much linked to the concept of this timeline, is a discount rate. Interest rates provide us with discount rates. And later on, in various areas of this curriculum, we're going to do plenty of discounting, especially when we perform valuation exercises. But let's say you've got an investment which promises you a cash flow after one year equal to 1,000 euros. So this may be a government uh, debt security. Very often you're told how much you're going to receive at the maturity date when uh, the instrument comes up for redemption. And the question you get asked if you participate in the markets is what price you're willing to pay today for something that promises to give you 1,000 in the future, for example. In this case, instead of going forward in time, you're kind of going back on the timeline and thinking to yourself, well, what is this worth for me today? And that's the process of discounting, which is um, a little bit opposite uh, of what we did before, thinking how much I want to get back in the future. Here, you know how much you'll get in the future and you're thinking, how much should I pay for, today, for it today? And that's the process of discounting. And depending on how much you obviously want to earn, these concepts are indeed linked, you're going to offer a different type of price um, based on a discount rate or indeed a required rate of return. Now, the third interpretation, which I want you to be aware of because your um, curriculum mentions it, is that the interest rate is also or can be viewed as an opportunity cost, right? Now, this is the opportunity cost, let's add, um, I'm going to add this in brackets, of current consumption. Now, don't confuse with consumption with the activity of eating food. Consumption here means spending money today, i.e., what's the alternative to spending money today? I, if I have $10,000 uh, in my pocket, which I don't, but if I had $10,000 in my pocket, I could take the decision to spend today i.e. do some consumption, but instead, as an alternative, I could invest. And when I invest, I do so at a certain rate of interest. 
maybe simply by keeping the money on an investment account at the bank. Now, that provides me with an opportunity of cost of spending. Instead of spending, I could earn something, an interest rate, hence this interpretation. So we just saw a couple of interpretations of what an interest rate may be viewed as being the opportunity cost, the required rate of return or a discount rate. Now, irrespective of which interpretation we choose to follow or apply, um, the fundamental thing is what is the level of interest rate? And right now I want to focus on the building blocks that determine the size or the level of interest rates there, how high or low they are. And um, so this is going to be irrespective of the previous interpretations. Let's start off by stating that a fundamental component of any interest rate is going to be what's known as the real risk-free rate of interest or simply a uh, rate. And that's going to be at the very beginning over here. And this is, and I'm going to use an ab abbreviation here, I slash R, in, which in my notation it's going to mean interest rate. The interest rate um, that we expect to make on an investment. So for an investment, think about this as if it were, for example, a bank account, some kind of savings account. But critically, if we expect absolutely no inflation, if no inflation is expected. Now, let me also emphasize that it's a risk-free rate. So it's an interest rate for an absolutely safe, risk-free investment where you know 100% that you're going to get the money back. I know that such 100% guarantees don't really work in reality, but the fact that it says real over here emphasizes or means that we expect no inflation. So you could think of this as pure compensation, not for the risk that you're taking, but pure compensation for the fact that you're deferring, delaying your consumption. You're using or you're investing money that you could use to spend on something nice today. And this interest rate gives you an alternative. Invest and therefore defer your consumption needs, put them aside, and you're going to get out something out of it, some kind of rate of return. Now, in reality, this is just the beginning. So let's add something to this and let's add to it lots of different premiums or premia. So I'm going to say premium, i.e. a bonus, something extra. And I'm opening up a category because over here we're going to have different premiums or different premia for various um, phenomena or concept. And for each premium, we're going, also going to identify that it is supposed to represent compensation for something specific. So compensation for. Now, the first premium that we're going to talk about is the premium for inflation or the inflation premium. Inflation. So easy enough. This is premium for expected inflation. When I invest money, I don't just want to be compensated for the fact that I'm deferring or delaying my present consumption, that I could be spending money, but I'm putting it aside and making an investment. I also want to be compensated for expected inflation. So when I charge you an interest rate on a loan, for example, I'm going to build into that interest rate my expectation of what inflation is going to be because inflation represents the erosion of purchasing power. So inflation premium. And uh, when you combine the real risk-free rate with the inflation premium, so these two things together, you end up getting what's known as the nominal risk-free rate. Nominal um, risk-free interest rate. Now, we're still claiming that this is a risk-free investment. There is no risk that somebody's not going to pay you back. So the only thing you want to be compensated for is the fact that by investing, you're putting aside present consumption and you're giving that up or at least delaying it. And you also want to be compensated for the expected erosion of purchasing power due to inflation. Later on over here, I'm going to expand on the nominal risk-free interest rate as being a um, the sum of these two, because this is just an approximation. There is a better 
more scientific way to compute this, which I'll show later on. Let's go, let's go ahead with the premium because we've got the inflation premium as one. Now let's um, focus on some more. The next one is going to be the premium for default risk or the default risk premium. Now, default is a term that we typically associate with uh, bonds. It represents uh, a situation in which the uh, issuer of bonds, so the borrower of money, fails to make a payment in full or in time. And uh, let me just say that this is compensation for the possibility that borrower, the borrower of money, obviously, so the target of our investment, will not make the contractual uh, promised payments. And this is just about, uh, just as much about uh, the amount of those payments. They, they will, will not receive those payments in the expected or contracted amount. But also, this concerns the timing of those payments. Timing is just as important. I mean, it's no good if somebody pays us, but they're several, several months or even years late. The next one is going to be liquidity or a premium called the liquidity premium. Now, this is, in fact, additional compensation that we expect for uh, an instrument not being on investment, not being liquid. When um, an investment is not liquid, i.e. it is not easy to get out of, it's not easy to sell to somebody else, you have to face the possibility that when you want to make an exit, you're going to have to do so at a severely discounted price, a price which is much lower than the true kind of inherent value of that investment. And that's due to lack of liquidity. So whenever investments or instruments are illiquid, you will face the risk of having to sell that investment for a price which is below, let's say over here, FV, where FV is going to represent fair value in this case. Now, in many applica applications, especially in quantitative methods, FV also stands for future value. Here, now let me make this clear, fair value. So below the true value, due simply to lack of liquidity, to the market not being liquid, lacking in buyers and sellers. Good. And let's have one more, which your curriculum identifies. So, we're building up what you expect to get compensated for and what you typically include in a rate of interest. We've got the real risk-free rate, which is the base. Onto this, we add the expected inflation premium, the default risk premium, the liquidity premium, which is all about certain securities, certain instruments rather lacking in liquidity. And then the final one, which is a bit tricky, is known as the maturity premium. Now, the reason this is tricky is because behind it is a concept that you'll explore in a lot more detail when you get to the fixed income section of the curriculum. And um, let me just write this over here. Don't have a lot of space on my board, but let's try to fit this in. The market value of, especially of debt securities, so things like bonds, is sensitive to changes in interest rates, okay? This is something you'll discover in a lot of detail later on, to changes in the level of interest rates in the market. So when interest rates go up and down, when central banks change interest rates, for example, debt securities fluctuate in value. And this fluctuation is especially pronounced, this sensitivity is especially big in the case of long-term debt securities. So let me write down here, seeing as I still have a lot of a bit of space, not a lot, just a bit. Long-term debt is always more sensitive to these changes than short-term debt, which is why long-term debt instruments will command a bit more of a maturity premium to represent the possible up and down movements which they may be exposed to as a result of interest rate changes. Long-term debt is simply more sensitive to what happens to interest rates than short-term debt. Hence, a maturity premium in the case of these types of investments. Okay, now I said I'm going to still 
talk a little bit more about the nominal risk-free rate. So let me do this perhaps over here, because um, this, what I wrote over here, this idea that the nominal risk-free interest rate being the simple sum of the real risk-free rate and the inflation premium. So just repeating what I've already got. Uh, please treat this as an approximation. So it's a very crude way of expressing or computing the nominal risk-free rate, but it's not the theoretically correct one. It works fine when you want to do a rough approximation, but if in the exam you're given the real risk-free rate and the inflation premium and asked to derive the nominal risk-free rate, or perhaps given this one, this one, and asked for this one, and whichever of the three, uh, you know, whichever two of the three you're given and asked to do the third one, please follow a slightly more sophisticated approach. One based on the following expression. One plus the nominal. Now, instead of writing risk-free every time, I'm just saying, going to say RF, risk-free interest rate, is equal to, and watch out, it's equal to one plus the real risk-free interest rate multiplied by one plus the inflation premium. Now, inflation premium is simply expected inflation, to be honest, because whatever we expect inflation to be, that's the level of compensation we think we should be getting. So one plus the nominal risk-free interest rate is the... Uh, multiplication of one plus this and one plus this instead of just adding the two. You'll get a slightly different number. Now this becomes even more important when the numbers are big, when the numbers are when the when all the components are pretty small, it doesn't really matter that much. But when the components become bigger uh, in a world of slightly higher interest rates, this starts making a bit of a difference. And in exam questions, please go with this expression rather than this one unless you can see that there isn't, I mean, the difference between the answers is so big that it doesn't really matter. If there's only a small difference between the different individual answers, this formula will be a lot better to use. So we have at least theoretically discussed the components of interest rates, those elements um, such as the inflation premium, the default risk premium, the liquidity premium and maturity premium. Now for a question to explore how this may be tested in the exam. And the question that you see now, now appearing in front of you is one that I've based on an example that's included in the curriculum. Mind you, there is no similar question in the end of chapter um, questions are coming after the uh, learning module, there is an example which is very similar to what you see here. So I decided to give you such a question. It may appear on the exam. Let's have a look. An analyst gathers the following information about the interest rates or rates of return and characteristics of four investments which make single payments at maturity. Now, don't worry for now about the single payment to maturity issue. That's uh, to do with uh, the maturity premium potentially, but it doesn't really matter so much. We've got the four investments listed for each one, a maturity. And please note that the first two have a maturity of three years. The uh, second two, um, number three and four, have maturities of five years. And for each one, we've got its level of um, distinct default risk and its level of liquidity. Now, this is not liquidity risk. This is liquidity as such. And the interest rate or rate of return associated with each of these investments. And we are told... Additionally, assuming the premiums relating to inflation, default risk and liquidity are constant across different maturities. The upper and lower limits for the interest rate on a uh, four-year investment characterized by low default risk and low liquidity are best approximated as. So we've got to provide some boundaries, upper and lower, for um, the rate of return um, on an investment with a maturity of four years with distinct default risk and liquidity characteristics. Now, obviously that doesn't appear over here, but we've got to make certain judgments, um, certain inferences. Okay, 
if you get such a question, it's it works a bit like a logical puzzle that you need to solve. Now, start off with, um, I guess in this case, I would start off with investments three and four. They share the same maturity, but look, one of them has low default risk, the other has high default risk, but they both share the same level of liquidity. Given the fact that maturities are the same, given the fact that liquidity levels are the same, the only thing that separates these two investments is the level of default risk. And obviously the one with the high default risk, that's investment number three, this one, is going to be associated with a higher rate of return, 6%. Um, as opposed to 5.3% for this uh, investment number four. So what I could say over here is, and I hope this 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 will you'll find this quite logical, that the reason why there is a 0.7% difference over here between them is due simply to default risk. So this is the default risk premium being the only explanation for why one of them makes a higher return than the other. Now, what about um, the investments with three-year maturities? That's investments one and two. Well, over here, the difference between them is, um, well, it's 3.5 versus 2.3, so that's 1.2. However, there are definitely more differences because um, default risk is different and liquidity levels are different for these two investments. So, you know, the critical piece of information here, assuming the premiums relating to inflation, default risk and liquidity are constant across different maturities. So once we've identified 0.7% being the default risk here, we can apply it to um, understand that space over here as well. It doesn't matter that it's a different, uh, you know, maturity. So let me say that the one with the higher default risk, right, is um, going to have be associated with a higher rate of interest, of course. And part of this explanation is the 0.7% default risk premium that we already know, which is due to the fact that investment uh, number one has high default risk, whereas investment number two has low default risk. But also, on top of that, investment number one has a low liquidity. Now, low liquidity doesn't mean something good, it means something bad. There's also going to be an additional liquidity premium, which is due to the lack of liquidity. It's extra compensation that investors in investment number one are going to demand due to the fact that the investment is not liquid or well, is characterized by low liquidity. Now, given the fact that there is a space of 1.2% between 2.3 and 3.5, okay, so an overall space or uh, variance of 1.2, and we've already got 0.7 of that solved, uh, the um, additional element is obviously going to be 0.5%, and these together explain the total 1.2% difference between 2.3 and 3.5. Now we have the liquidity premium, we've got the default risk premium um, identified and computed. Let's now try and answer the question. They're asking us here for a um, four-year investment characterized by low default risk and low liquidity. So let me actually write this down. Four-year maturity, and when it comes to default risk, it's going to be low, but also low liquidity. And, um, well, I guess the easiest thing to do is try and base this on two adjoining, but accordingly, three-year investments and five-year investments. So if I surround these four years, but by a three-year and a five-year investments, that's going to share the same characteristics. So low and low, essentially, and here low and low, I should be able to say, well, anything that appears with a four-year maturity must be somewhere in between what we get here and here. Because of the maturity premium, a five-year investment with the same characteristics, low, low, in terms of default risk and liquidity, must have a higher rate of return 
then the four year and the three year must have a lower return. However, I don't have as a base right now a three year investment with low, low. I either, I either have low and high or high and low. So I need to make, you know, I need to, I need to do a bit of a workaround. I mean, if I start off with this one, the, the one that has a rate of return of 2.3%, that's low default risk, which is good, but high liquidity, um, which is not what I'm looking for. So in order to turn this into a rate of return that I would expect from a low liquidity investment, I would need to take this number, but accordingly, now think about it, what should we do? If an investment is supposed to have low liquidity, you're supposed to, well, you should actually add the liquidity premium. So that would be 2.3% increased by 0 0.5, which was identified as the liquidity premium. So I would end up over here looking at 2.8%. Or we could potentially work the other way around and start off with this number, the, you know, the 3.5% over here. Now, this one's got the right level of liquidity being low, but it's got high default risk. Now, in order to turn this into the figure that I should be looking for here, I need to neutralize the effect of high default risk, which would be to deduct the default risk premium. And the default risk premium, whichever way you look at it, is 0.7%. So that would be 3.5%, but minus 0.7. And hey, you still get 2.8. So it doesn't matter which one you start with. Once you know what the relevant premium are, premiums are, you're going to get there. Now, same thing for the five-year one. Um, low, low. Well, as we said, I don't have low, low. I only have high, high or low, high. Well, let's start with this one. This one's going to be easier to start with this 5.3, isn't it? Because at least one of the parameters is okay. It's the default risk, which is, which is low, and that's good. Um, how do I neutralize the high liquidity? Well, high liquidity is a good thing. If an investment is characterized by low liquidity, then you need to, once again, add the uh, liquidity um, premium, unfortunately. So instead of having a, um, a 5.3 here, let's have a look. How do I get an arrow? How do I squeeze an arrow here? Maybe like this. So I would have 5.3% as a starting point, but I would need to add the um, liquidity premium, uh, wouldn't I? So that would be 0.5% used again and we would end up with 5.8%. If I wanted to start off with the investment number three, five years, but high, high on both counts, I would, you know, I, I would start off with 6%, but I would um, need to accordingly to this, from this 6%, I would need to deduct the default risk premium. So that's six minus 0 0.7, which would get us to 5.3 but to then add the liquidity premium, and I would end up with 5.8 anyway. So whichever way you do this, and please appreciate that there's more than one way to solve this problem, you will finish with an estimate for the interest rate on the four-year investment with the characteristics low and low when it comes to default risk and liquidity uh, as being anywhere, you know, somewhere between 2.8, and 5.8, which uh, leads us to select answer A uh, over here, higher than 2.8, but lower than 5.8, and appreciate that this is more or less a logical exercise. In the exam, if you get this type of question, please approach it in this way, and you know you won't spend as much time <laughs> thinking about it as I did explaining it, because you will just find one way of solving it. But first, identify the liquidity and default risk premium components, and just work your way through the problem. It's an easy thing which you can fit in under you know one minute probably. So a brilliant question to answer um, if you get it in the exam.